Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank the committee for their invitation to speak here today. It's good to see those being impacted upon directly by the proposed changes in the working group's review document are being afforded this opportunity. You've read my submission, which contains more detailed notes, and I'm happy to answer any questions on that. But I wanted to open by trying to explain what we want from the law, why we want it, and why you want it too. As I said in my submission, what I and many other shooters would wish to see in the Firearms Act is a clear and unambiguous set of rules regarding firearms licensing, which are readily readable by everyone and which are enforced equally in all Garda districts. In my submission, I've gone into some detail on some of the technical problems that at present prevent that being the case, uh, such as the layered nature of the Firearms Act and other acts that make up the body of firearms law in Ireland, and others will no doubt present other aspects of this problem, and I expect the national governing bodies will present the details of their respective sports. But there's a fundamental perspective to this problem which I suspect may not be obvious to those outside the shooting community and which would assist the committee in understanding our viewpoint. In our sport, everything is measurable. Uh, the size, the shape, the weight of our firearms, the calibre of rounds used, the weight and thickness and tailoring of the clothing used, um, the, our stores, where our shots land, how they were fired and so on. Our sports coaching is built on this fact, our rule books are built on this fact, um, and it permeates every single aspect of what we do and the culture that surrounds that. <coughs> We're in a sport that is unique for its brutal honesty. You aim the shotgun, rifle or pistol and you pull the trigger, and then either you hit the target or you don't, and you can't hide from it. Everyone sees what happens. You can't say that uh, you did well but the judge uh, gave you some sort of unbiased or a biased opinion. You can't say that you did well but your team let you down. Um, you, you, can't say the, you can't say the ref was blind, you can't say any, anything other than that your own skill was the reason for the good or bad outcome of that shot. It's a fundamental part of the attraction to the sport. It's why 20 years into the sport, every minute I spend in the range I enjoy as much as the first. It's, it's there, there is nothing like it that I've ever found in sport and very little I've ever found like it in life. And to answer some of the questions that were being asked in this room earlier, this is why we do this. This is the fundamental attraction for this sport. Um, it does have the side effect that we are used to clear objective rules, which make judgments based on physical features or events that can be measured in the real world with instruments. And so the judgments are mathematical in their objectivity. For example, an ISAF air rifle must weigh 5.5 kilograms or less according to the rule book. At the start of a competition, my rifle is weighed. If the scales say 5.5, I can enter the competition. If they say 5.6, I cannot. The judge running equipment control does not have to make a subjective decision. He or she just reads the scale. The rule is clear and easy to read, and everyone can look at a single rule book and see what that rule is, and competitors can check that they pass that rule ahead of time using the same equipment the judge will use, and they can be confident they will pass on the day. In contrast to this, the Firearms Act is frustratingly complex to read, and there is no single rule book for everyone to look at, and the judgments it calls for are highly subjective, and how they are reached is opaque to the applicant. And the decisions which affect us vary from issuing officer to issuing officer, so what is allowed and what isn't under the Act is often a function of your address, with no way to tell ahead of time what that might be, and I'm not even touching on the problems of those parts of Irish firearms law that are plainly daft, although we can discuss that if you wish. Um, this may sound like a niche problem, which affects a small number of sports people in a minority sport, but it is not. It has an effect on the public in general. We've seen hundreds of district, high and Supreme Court cases over the last decade or so, many of which have as a fundamental cause a firearms act that is effectively unreadable to the average person. These cases not only represent enormous amounts of time and money and stress to shooters, the equivalent of building and equipping several badly needed national level shooting ranges, but they also represent thousands of Garda man hours and millions of euros of public money and obviously the court's time, um, which are badly needed elsewhere, not arguing in a court over fiddly points of badly written law with people who frankly would rather be on the range taking part in our sport. Myself, I've spent years involved in the legislative side of our sport and bluntly I regard that as time wasted and sporting opportunities lost. We had no choice but to be involved, even from the first days our sports were at risk of being crippled purely by oversight or misunderstanding in the drafting process. But there are far better uses in our sports for our resources. If we had clear, universal rules in the Act, that would be possible. The only way I know of to get to that happy scenario from where we are now is, as I recommended in my submission, to undertake a restatement of the Firearms Act. Once we have the Act written clearly in one place, we can consider correcting some of its more obvious anomalies, but until then, if we apply more patches to an already overpatched body of law, we will simply be confusing the, situ the situation even more than it currently is, and we will in all likelihood create more problems than we solve. If we go down that road, we'll be right back here again in a few years, 
with even more Garda Manors and public money and sporting resources lost as a result. And in the meantime, the average voter is even more in the dark about what protections the law provides them, and given how the media portray problems like gun crime, this can be nothing but a source of fear. Good law should reassure people by showing that a potential risk is understood and a fair system exists to govern it. The Firearms Act at present fails woefully in this task because almost nobody really knows what's in it. I would urge the committee, therefore, to reject the review's proposals in their current form, to recommend that the Firearms Act be restated to give us a known baseline to work from, and that the changes whose necessity will by then have become clear and obvious to everyone be worked on by all the stakeholders together to produce a clear, readable, boringly consistent law which everyone understands and can follow. The first Firearms Act stood unamended for almost 40 years because it had those characteristics. So while it is a privilege to appear here today before the committee, I would hope its decision will be one that means we don't meet again until 2055. With all due respect. Thank you. Like, dislike us that much. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, the, the the issue of a consolidated piece of legislation. I think is what you're talking about there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for that. Uh, weapons, you, weapons you have for sale in gun shops in Ireland. Yes, sir. Uh, Sorry, uh, Mr. Conrad. Before we go on, I, I was taken to task recently by by somebody who said that we shouldn't use weapon. They're firearms. It's a technical thing, I think. But anyway, um, weapons. I'm told are are designed to hurt and kill and use for that. I didn't know either. I should have. I'm not an expert. I'm not my, but I think okay. we should use the term can firearms. I, can I, can the I, just a small point, Mr. Chairman. It's been, uh, we've discussed um, the secure accommodation regulations this morning and today. It hasn't been mentioned yet that these are the minimum requirements. So when the CPO comes out to your house and he inspects it, he's completely free in his recommendation to the superintendent to ask for more security than the SI calls for. And it's been upheld and done, and it's been upheld in, in, in by the Supreme Court. And it, it's basically it's it's the law. If the superintendent wants you to have a, a higher level of security, he's completely entitled to ask for that on a case by case basis. So if he thinks that, you know, the area you're living in, you need to have a monitored alarm, even though you won't, you don't, you have a class of arm that doesn't require it by law, by law, he's completely allowed to ask for that. So there, there's no. There isn't a public safety issue on this because the, the law has considered this quite well. Okay, thank you. Further questions, uh, Deputy? Yeah, um, if, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Mr. Dehi, you, you are indicated. Yeah. Um, I'd like to start off. I, I just have two points to make. The first is perhaps a small one, um, but <laughs> language shapes thought. And we keep using the word weapon. I'd re I have a very low expectation uh, of what I'd like to see from today, but my Christmas list is if we could stop using that word. If we could stop using that word, I'd be a really happy man, okay. because I don't have weapons. This, and I'm happy, if you want to read this, this is fine. I can't submit it, unfortunately, to the committee. It's a, there's an official document aspect to it. This is my firearm certificate. The word weapon appears nowhere on this. It appears nowhere in the legislation that governs the issuing of this. And quite frankly, I, I know that we always train everybody to, uh, from the first day that they start in target shooting to believe every firearm is lethal or could be lethal if, if abused. In, in truth, the actual firearm that this uh, uh, certificate is for is my air pistol, and it, yes, it, it could actually be lethal. I would have to hold you down and beat you with it uh, in order to kill you with it. If I tried to shoot you with it, you, you, you would just get annoyed. Um, I, I, I would literally have to feed you the pellets in your stew from the cafeteria to give you lead poisoning to harm you with this thing. It, it, <laughs> I, I've gone into countries with this and presented the license uh, to the customs agents and they've looked at me and kind of gone, that's not a real gun, what are you talking about? Um, so just, just that one word, because it, it, when people keep saying weapon, they keep having these rather unusual beliefs about what it is that we do. Um, they keep seeing Hollywood films in their head. I've trained about a thousand people over the years to shoot. I've never met one who knew what we did before he started or she started. Um, and they're always of the opinion that it's nothing like what they thought it would be. And about the best description I've ever heard of our sports is that it's like golf without the exciting bits. So. People keep saying weapon, and it, 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 it's confusing on one level. It's it's just downright silly on another level. I I would just love if we could stop using that word. We do our best. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I know it's a no, funny point. Second point, point Nick. The second point is we've mentioned the word resemble when we were talking about uh, what the, the 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 law defines as an assault rifle. I, I mentioned in my opening statement there are a lot of very daft areas uh, anomalies in the the Irish firearms law. That's one of them. Um, <laughs> The law actually says that if it's a semi-automatic or, or an automatic rifle or something that looks like one, then it's an assault rifle. Now, 
somebody has to make a judgment of whether or not rifle A looks like this in order to decide what kind of license you get and is it going to be an unrestricted license or a restricted license. And unrestricted and restricted licenses are not like um, a supersets of one another. I can't get the harder version and it'll cover me for the other case. It's like a, a motorcycle and a car license. If I have a license for one and I'm stopped in the other, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm for the high jump. Right? It's the same with, with, with firearms. If I have a license for an unrestricted firearm and I'm told I have a restricted one on my hands, I'm, I'm in trouble. But it's also the other way around. If I have a restricted firearm in my hands and I have an unrestricted license, that license doesn't cover me. So when you have that severity of penalty, because it's up to seven years in jail and 20 grand in fines if you're convicted. So if, I, if that's the severity of the penalty, and the only way we can tell whether or not you should have one kind of license or the other is someone going, well, that looks like this to me, then there's a problem with the law. And that's a legislative issue that, that really should have been fixed a long time ago. We brought it up at the time, but it's, it's, it's still there. Okay. So subject to... Okay, thank you. Mr. Talk, you indicated as well, I think. Yeah. Was, was final, final question. Um, I think the practical issue, as I understood it from the Gardaí, was that they don't want anybody to have possession of a weapon. You know, obviously, Fire automatic. Uh, I'll tell you why I'm going to say weapon. I actually don't agree with your point. I think you have to remember, you're members, members of sporting clubs. We're lay people here in the Oireachtas. The vast, vast majority of citizens wouldn't draw a distinction between a weapon or a firearm in their own. Because, you know, you, you live in a world where, you know, it's the Hollywood culture. You watch the movies. People, the, the difference between weapons and firearms, I, I know f you're focusing on that terminology. Uh, for most people out there, they wouldn't see a difference. I don't think that's the most important point, frankly. But in, ter but in terms of the issue of the uh, automatic rifles, weapons... Any first uh, it's, again. it's just... Uh, I understand the deputy's point uh, regarding how lay people regard the word weapon and the word firearm. Um, I don't actually... Honestly, I don't have a problem with that. I, I've trained, like I said, several thousand or several hundred people. When they come in, they don't know anything about our sport, and we don't turn around and, and slap them in the face and say, get out, because you call it a weapon. All right? But it's our job to train. Yeah. But uh, if I'm talking, say, for example, to my father, like I was a few days ago in my kitchen, and he says the word weapon when he's talking about these things, I don't haul him up on it. Mm. It's an informal chat. You know? I don't have one of these lovely little light-up microphones in my kitchen. And I don't talk to the people, like the men and women who draft our laws in my kitchen. This is not an informal setting. This is a formal. It's a fair point, yeah. And that's why I'm. I'm a, well, I can tell you right now, there's about 10,000 people watching us on that camera, and I'm fairly sure a large number of them are laughing at me for this, but it's, it's just. This is such a fundamental thing. This gets in below all the stuff we're talking about because it's shaping the way you're thinking about it from the outside. That's, that's why I'm. No, it's a fair point that it's accepted. Yeah. And yeah. Language is important, Mr. McGann. Yes, language. I'd just like the, the legislation of the jurisdictions. The, the, the experience of other jurisdictions. Is there many other jurisdictions across the world that have a, a regime similar to ours where the police service more or less uh, run it? Mr. Dinny. Well, the, the nearest local example would probably be the UK where it's a police function. But our system is, well, yeah, our system is wildly different to the way it's done anywhere else in the world. Uh, we don't license the individual, we license the firearm, which has some interesting side effects. Uh, for example, uh, we can tell you exactly how many firearms there are licensed in Ireland today. Uh, if you ask me how many people have a firearm uh, who are licensed to own, I can't tell you that. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen that figure presented to the doll ever. So the, the, the simple question about how many people have a gun, no one knows the answer. Um, because you can have people who have two or three licenses, you can have a firearm which is licensed to two or three people. So you'd have to go through all of Pulse and audit all the data, and it would be a monumental task to, to come up with that, simply because of the way the system is structured. So when we try to compare ourselves to other, other jurisdictions, there are massive fundamental differences to how we do things here. Um, that that they, they make simple comparisons almost impossible. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, just welcome the opportunity to make my Okay, Mr. Dindy, you wanted to respond there again. Yes. The initial question as to what changes we'd make. Um, after having studied this thing for 10 odd years, which <laughs> 10 years I'd like to get back, to be entirely honest, um, there are definitely things in there that are broken. Uh, like, for example, uh, I, I don't think it's right that since 2009, any stag party that goes off paintballing in Wicklow for a weekend uh, are all committing a breach of the Firearms Act that technically requires them to be put in jail for seven years and fined 20 grand. 
um, along with everyone who works for the companies that run these services. Uh, I don't think anyone would, would, would think that that was a great way to have your law. There's a bunch of other things. There's the fact that um, hunters who are going out uh, to shoot rabbits for the pot, um, if they take a, a shot before they start hunting the rabbit to make sure that their sights are aligned, that's technically target shooting outside of an unauthorised range. That's an illegal act. Um, and in fact, the Minister for Justice at the time uh, said himself afterwards that that was an unintentional uh, whoopsie in the law. Um, there's an awful lot of bits in the law that we can point to and say are whoopsies, and that, that's, that's just a really awful thing. So if we're going to talk about changes, the very first thing we need to do is take the law, because there's the, the Farms Act 1925, then there are eight more acts that amend parts of it. Yeah. Nothing's ever been repealed, so we've got this huge pump and set of layer of the thing. Yeah. There's then another 12 acts that uh, have parts in them that define uh, the behaviour that target users and, hunter, hun and hunters are supposed to follow. So that's the Wildlife Act, there's, there's the Airport Act, there's, um, uh, the, there's the Explosive Act, which covers the reloading that, that Joe's shooters do. There's, uh, there's acts actually from before the founding of the state. Both the Explosive Acts are from before then. And the, the, there's the Summary Ju uh, Jurisdiction Act from 1851 that still applies, uh, which relates to how far away from a road you have to be before you can start hunting bunnies. Um, all of these things, there's, there's no one single place that a person who's just starting off in the sport can go and look and see this is the other rules I must adhere to. So before we start making any changes to these things, which frankly there's just a list, but we need to have a solid base to work from. So really what has to be done is that all those nine or ten acts that amended the Farms Act have to be restated under the Statute of Law Restatement Act from 2002. That's been called for by the Law Reform Commission in 2004, and it was called for a few years ago in the High Court by Justice Charlton. It's never been done. Um, the Law Reform Commission has prepared informal uh, restatements of these, these acts. Um, the only textbook that has ever been written uh, on farms law in Ireland, which was only just published last year, it has a restatement in one of the appendices. But that's not the same thing as a restatement of the Act under the law, because at that point we would take all the stuff that's gone before and repeal it and replace it with the Firearms Act as amended, so that we now have a single document we can all go to. If we do that, then we can start talking about the fairly silly things that need to be fixed that are in it, um, so that we don't have things like, like, for example, I'm doing my Christmas shopping this year. I walk into, uh, I won't name the shop. Um, <laughs> I walk into a popular shop in a popular shopping centre, and the first thing I see as I walk in the door are a, uh, a there's a, a, a shelf full of toy crossbows that are being sold. Now they're obviously toys, they're obviously meant uh, for like firing suction darts at, at, at walls and this kind of thing. Under the current Firearms Act, that's a restricted firearm and needs to be uh, licensed, and if you don't have a license for it, that's seven years in jail at 20,000 euros in fines, and that's beyond silly. <laughs> Do you know? Uh, no, no. Um, uh, <laughs> Don't give me ideas. So you propose that, that Santa Claus be jailed. Okay. Um, yeah, I, the consolidation of acts is, 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 um, is something that happens now and again, but it's usually very complex and takes quite a while and so forth. But we'll certainly look into the Lord Bond Commission report and others. And if there are other uh, such documents out there, you might, if, if you, I'd invite you to make uh, them available to the clerk, to the committee. Because, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done in this whole area. If I might suggest, I mean, I, 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 I mentioned this in the submission. We could take the, uh, the, the uh, restatements that have been done by the Law Reform Commission and by the, uh, Mark Mac uh, McDonald, who's the, the barrister who wrote the only uh, law book on this. Um, they could be used as working documents by the firearms consultation panel, have all the stakeholders come together with a, a baseline document, point out what, what's broken in it, fix those, and then pass that as a as new firearms act that repeals everything that's gone before, so we have the one thing. Okay, I can feel a recommendation coming on here. Um, are you done? Uh, Mr. Tim, did you, you indicated anything first? Yeah. Um, in 2004, uh, I was at the time the Secretary of the NTSA. We went in, we met with the Department of Justice because at that time they were starting to draft the Farms Bill 2004, which became the 2006 Act. Um, one of the suggestions in the draft initially was that uh, it, you would basically be des describing um, assault rifles as a, a rifle that had a pistol grip and a collapsible stock. Every air pistol, or every air rifle, and every small bore rifle used in the Olympics has a pistol grip and a stock which adjusts, which could be defined as collapsing, because every single human being has a different distance from where the stock goes on your arm, or well, for air rifle, it goes on your shoulder for anything bigger, um, and then your eye, which is in the aim. So that has to be adjustable, because you're paying two and a half thousand euros for a rifle, you want it to fit, all right? So when we start talking about 
what we define these things as in the Act, it, it, this is the effect that it has on sports people. But the Act is kind of odd in that it deals with two separate groups, and there's two separate scenarios that it's talking about. On one hand, it's talking about us. It's talking about law-abiding people who are, you know, engaged in sport or hunting or veterinary practice or, you know, airport safety or whatever. And it, it covers how the, these things are licensed, and that's what the assault rifle bit talks about. And then on the other hand, it's also talking about every murderer, every terrorist, every, you know, every drug dealer out there. And there's a whole other section of the Act deals with that, and it's about possessing firearms within, without licenses and with intent to endanger life and so on. Um, that's nothing to do with us. And so when we find that the definition of assault rifle going into our section of it, we're kind of confused. And it's not necessarily a fantastic association to have in our, in our minds. But the other thing as well is that uh, what, what the scenario you just described, where someone walks into a, a post office and points a gun at the, the, the poor woman behind the, the counter. Under Irish law, it doesn't matter if it's a gun. If I point a toy at someone behind the counter, and say, you know, this is a robbery, stick him up or what have you. I'm going to jail for the same length of time as if I'd used a loaded firearm. Because the law doesn't make a distinction between whether the firearm is real, whether the firearm is loaded, or, or anything else. The fact that you pointed something at a person that they thought was a loaded firearm and you acted like it was, that's what sets out the offence. And that means that you're going to jail for the same amount of time, regardless of what you were actually holding in your hands. So, you know... There's this idea that we're trying to get around things that would concern public safety, and that, that, that's kind of... I, 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 it's very difficult to try to explain how far in a concept that is. Mm. That everyone's, I mean, most people sitting here, we, we have kids. We, 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 you know, if you want, after the meeting, I can sit you down and I can show you photographs of the most beautiful child ever born in Irish history, and, and you know, quite happily bore you to death with it. Okay. And I'm very concerned about his public safety. Because he's a member of the public, and I'm a member of the public, and so when we start talking about that with this, it, it's, it's a bit confusing because there's nothing in this in this in this law that says that we're a separate group from the public. Mm. Okay, mm. So it, 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 when we start talking about the licensing laws, the stuff that applies to us, this half of the Firearms Act, it's really important to keep it distinct in our minds from the other half of the Firearms Act, which is about the people that none of us would like to be seen given the time of day, and which most of us want to see locked up for the rest of our lives. And in fact, that's what the law applies to, in most cases, the life sentence for half these things. Okay, thank you. Mr. Castell, you indicated as well, did you? I, yeah, uh, I to just to, to re-emphasize that point, um, under Article 6 of the EU Directive 91477, which has been out since 1991, which is part of our law, um, any automatic firearm uh, uh, comes under the heading of Category A in the EU, and it cannot be licensed by any civilian. And in fact, you can only possess them if you have specific permission from your government, which would basically mean in the end, Kenny would have to write us a note saying we could have one. But the actual directive states that all member states should prohibit people from having these things. Thank um, you. So just, it's just not an issue. That's fine. Um, I want to thank you all again for being here today. If you're again, again, again,